feeling, I'm feeling spry. Hey everybody, it's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. It is, <clears throat> what is it? May 11th, the day before Mother's Day. So you may be listening to this episode Saturday night or very early Sunday morning or my, my listeners over in Australia and England and London and Germany and all them and Italy. You might be listening to this. No, you probably won't be. It's Mother's Day. That's why I'm trying to put this thing out early because tomorrow or today, if you're listening to this, I'm trying to make it in real time, is Mother's Day. Um, I don't have a mother anymore. She died. My wife doesn't have a mother anymore. She died. But the mother of my three beautiful daughters has Mother's Day tomorrow, and it has somehow became part of a tradition where even though the woman you're married to is not your mother, you bathe them in, in frankincense, incense, and what is it? Frankincense and myrrh, something like that? Yeah. Anyway, so tomorrow's Mother's Day. I have to pay 110% to anything she wants to do. Hopefully it's just... You know, nice dinner, easy breakfast, uh, a bike ride, and maybe uh, go to the 18th Amendment down in Muskegon and have a cocktail. Who knows? We'll see what she wants to do, but that's why you're getting this a little early. Um, the episode I just did, oh, well, I, no, see, I, I'm so excited about this episode because it was just a really fun one with Justin, question and answers, and you and listeners came up with not just some dog problem questions. Um, I mean, most of them were, of course, but there was some good ones in there. Really enjoyed doing it. But let's get on, let's get on with the show. You know, I gotta, you know where I start? I got to start with Patreon. Patreon patrons, y- y- you're rocking it. You are my biggest sponsor. And uh, if it wasn't for you, I don't know that I, yeah, I'd probably keep doing this, but I wouldn't do it with as much zeal. And I wouldn't have plans to take this show on the road uh, if it wasn't for you guys. Because you guys are, are, are putting that, you're putting that commitment into the show. Uh, a couple dollars a month, you know, it's all you got to do, and I'll tell you what you're going to get. You're going to get a video of the last thing that Justin and I talked about, and uh, I'm not sure if we had the record button on yet, or at that point, I think we stopped it, but he was addressing the fact that on the last episode that we did, somebody put an iTunes, uh, I guess you'd call it a complaint, you know, they gave it a low rating, because the way they listened to my question or the way Justin was talking about a dog, they took it as that he doesn't play fetch ever with a dog until he's 18 months of age. And that is so far from the truth. But he, he explains that at the very end of the podcast. We're going to get into that, into that comment on iTunes. But what we did is we went to his training room, and he's got a year-old setter. This dog has never had a bird in its mouth. He was not concerned about retrieving. He knows the mother, the grandmother, and the great-grandmother of this dog line. He's seen enough of these dogs. He knows if he's going to have it, he's going to have it. He saw enough stuff early, just dog picking up sticks and things like that, you know. No birds in this dog's mouth, one year old, did all of its field work, took took it out this spring, and it was just rocking it on spring woodcock and grouse. Beautiful little setter. It made me want one. I'm not going to do that, but made me want one. And uh, he said that I will give, I will bet you $100 on the outcome of this dog's first contact on a retrieve of a dead bird. And he said, if I'm wrong, when we go to the RGS banquet here in a couple minutes, we're, we're going to leave right from there, that he was going to donate an extra $100 to RGS if he was wrong. Well, I'm not going to tell you how that came out, but what I am going to do is I'm going to put the video up on Patreon so my Patreon listeners can watch the video and show you a dog that's never had a bird in its mouth by an owner and a trainer who is never in a hurry to get to where he's going with a dog. And that little video is going to be up for my Patreon patrons. And you listeners, you know, if you bump into me, if you come to the BHA Pint Night, you know, that RGS BHA Pint Night, I might tell you how the thing came out. I might even show you the video on my phone. But the rest of you listeners, you have to live in suspense. So that's what Patreon patrons get. You know what else we get? We get our title sponsor, Pike Gear. I was with Brent Pike last night at the RGS banquet. We had a ball. Uh, It was a good time. We went out to uh, another place across the street after after the venue closed down. Um, I won, what did I win? I won three magazine subscriptions. Yeah. 
out of all the tickets I threw out there, three magazine subscriptions, and one of them was redundant. I won two, two subscriptions to uh, not Hunting Dog Journal, uh, Shooting Sportsman. Yeah, two. So I'm gonna give I'm gonna gift one to a friend of mine. I'll get to renew my, I, I get that magazine anyway, so I guess I got a free renewal out of the deal. Wasn't a bad way. Supported RGS. Had a good time. And uh, Brent and I were there. He's coming up with some cool T-shirt designs that are probably going to come out before the close, and those are going to be some of the things listeners of, of all different levels and tiers are going to be able to uh, get on some of the first orders with Pike Gear when it comes out. Just keep looking it up. Keep following Instagram. Send him questions if you got it. Uh, he's putting some pictures up lately of some of the gear. It's going to be nice. Technical gear for the Upland Hunter by Pike Gear. There. Well, that almost sounded like a commercial. I'm going to try to run through. No, you know what? I'm not going to run through it. I'm just going to, I'm going to bump the order because I usually do Purina next, right? No, I got to tell you that I put out a call to everybody. I don't know what it was. Two months ago, three months ago. Was, I think it was January. And I said, if anybody out there works at a dealership, owns a dealership, knows somebody who owns a dealership, who might have a bird dog, who might listen to the podcast, and who might want to sponsor this podcast when it's on the road with a vehicle, please call me. And I think it was about 18 hours later, on a Monday morning, I get an email from Brandon Berkston of Salem Auto Sports in Trevor, Wisconsin. And he basically says, I'm in. I'm like, what? Really? He goes, yep, I'm in. Uh, Brandon, a co cool guy, uh, not, a, not, a, not a novice hunter, but a, a, a novice to the German short hair world and the testing world. He's joined NAVDA. He's going to run this dog May 18th in its first NA test. His GSP is a year old, gorgeous dog. Oh my God. It, it is really, you know, I see a lot of German short hairs that look like they got crossed with a Vishla. Uh, Ansel is not one of them German short hairs. But anyway, Brandon in Salem Auto Sports is supplying me a vehicle to drive around and interview more people, go to more events. You're going to hear a lot about them. Thank you, Brandon. Great to meet you, Ansel. Can't wait to get back to Trevor. Oh, and this is the deal. See, I never, you younger people, I know you're not going to go out and buy a $50,000 truck. And this is what Brandon's, you know, Brandon's Autosport or Salem Autosports, is, is they specialize in trucks. I mean, they've got cars on the lot, but they specialize in trucks and finding good ones and finding them from different parts of the country. And uh, so if you're looking for a first time, you're, you're in it. You, you, you've, got, you've got the dog. You've got the shotgun. You've got the desire. You've got to have something. You're probably going to need four-wheel drive, more than likely. And uh, so you can go to SalemAutosports.com. You can see what they got listed. You can call up Brandon anytime. He'll try to look for a car for you, or he'll keep his eyes open, or he'll put your name on a post-it note and say, when I get one of these... Um, I mean, while I was there, there must have been eight customers coming. Do you have this? Is this still here? Yeah, here's a key. It, it was crazy. It was like going, and their shop is like going into an old hardware store. There's a 1933 Ford uh, coupe in there, all rusted up and redone, you know, like, like original body and, and uh, you know, new engine put in it. And there's a, a Ford Mustang, like the kind they did in uh, Fast and Furious, you know, one of them fastback. I mean, there's antique toys all over the place. You, you feel like you're, like you walk in, you're like, yeah, I like this place. I'll buy, I'll buy something from you. So anyway, look at SalemAutosports.com. Talk to Brandon. Give me a holler. And as the episodes go by, when he gets something that he thinks is really geared toward the bird hunter, really geared toward a great price and a used truck, you know, we're going we're gonna to put a few of them up there. Now, let's get back to our regularly scheduled sponsors. Purina, Gunner Kennels, Beretta Shotguns, Mountain Ops, Onyx Hunt. Gumleaf Boots, Orion Coolers, Backridge Ammunition, Perrin Brewery, ESP Shooting Protection. I'm going to I don't know how I'm going to get through all this. And I'm going to try to save you a little bit of time because you know this is all top shelf stuff. I, I do not have anything as a sponsor that's not top shelf. Go to my website. You can click on any of my sponsors. You can click on Purina, you'll find out about them. You can click on Gunner, you'll find out about their lifetime discount or their lifetime guarantee. And you know you got the Patreon discount if you're a Patreon patron. Breda Shotguns, Mountain, all their information is on the website. I really want you to go to the website. In fact, when you go, subscribe to it because that way we get a mailing list. And you know what? Ask anybody who's done it. 
might not know anybody who's done it, but I can tell you, we do not flood you with emails every morning. I, I think we've done one or two bulk emailings, and that's just to show people what's coming up and what's going on. So go to the website, look at all of our sponsors. Don't forget with Onyx, you get 20% off the promo code HDP, Gumleaf Boots. I'm going to come back to you with the promo code for that because I have to look it up. It's the May special. I'll come back. Orion Coolers, 20% off at HDP60. Backridge Ammunition, there, I just talked to, I just talked to, uh, I just talked to Adam Ziegler this morning. We talk a lot. We're starting to become like best buddies. I, I talked to him like three times a week. And uh, we're talking about some new stuff and some 3-inch 28 gauge he's going to be developing. If you're one of them sub-gauge sub guys, yeah. Yeah, he's got some big plans. Parent Brewery, don't forget, May 30th, please come out if you're within any kind of safe driving distance. Okay, and I, I call that 500 miles. You know, like pretend we live in Montana and, you know, driving four or five hours is no big deal to go do something. Come to Parent Brewery, May 30th. We're going to have a BHA, RGS, HDB pint night. Ben Jones, the CEO of Rough Grouse Society, is coming in for this event because we're partnering up with Rough Grouse Society like we've done with Pheasants Forever, like I've done with NAVDA, and RGS. You're going to hear a lot more stuff about RGS. I know a lot of you guys are grouse hunters. We're, uh, so you want to you come meet the CEO? If you got a complaint, if you got a compliment, eh, don't save the complaints for emails. But come on over May 30th. There's actually another special guest coming. I'm not even going to tell you who that is till next week. Okay? ESP Shooting Protection. Okay? They are uh, unbelievable. Okay? I've used them again. And other than my little cauliflower ear starting into one ear, I, I, I probably, I, I'm going to have a hard time wearing them all day because it's kind of like having a shoe that doesn't fit, but that's my fault. That's my fault because they do jujitsu. Um, it, it is a game changer. In fact, I was talking to Justin yesterday about it. He might be getting a pair of them. Um, he, he's, a, he's an earplug guy. All, he does not, all these, all these dogs he shoots over all day and blank guns and cap guns. Um, I think we've got to talk to ESP about getting Justin set up with a, a promo code. It'd be nice to have a promo code. I'll talk to him. Did I get everybody? I think I got everybody. And if I didn't, go to the website and go to iTunes. And rate and review, especially after this podcast. I'm telling you what, this one was totally, totally fun. Uh, we answered a few questions, and I still have a stack. I'm sorry if I didn't get to them. If you read between the sheets, most people say between the lines. If you read between the sheets, a lot of your other questions are going to be answered if you listen to Justin's answers to these questions. But I saved a bunch of them. We'll be doing these again. Justin's going to be on here, a regular guest, you know. And we'll get to your questions, hopefully. Some of them were almost so identical that you, you just get to close your eyes and pretend we're answering your email, okay? Um, what else? God, I think that's it. This actually might be a shorter intro than usual. I'm going to have to re-listen to it and see. Talk to you. Bye. Okay, as promised, the promo codes for all listeners for Gumleaf Boots for the month of May for their field welly, their field boot, is M-A-Y-H-D-P. That's all listeners. Every one of you. Every stinking one of you. And Patreon patrons, later today I will put up the promo code. And a couple people already wrote in and already bought boots. I just forwarded their email to Jackie. You can do it that way too. I'll get that promo code for Patreon patrons who are going to save even a little more money. Bye. All right, everybody. You know who it is? You know where I'm at? I bet you don't know where I'm at. No, you probably did because you saw the title of this episode coming up. I'm at Black Creek Training Center with Justin McGrail, the one, the only. Good afternoon. <laughs> How's it going, Justin? Good. Well, we shouldn't act like I just sat down. We've been out running, running dogs for a couple hours. Yeah. We took Taffy and, a, and another cocker out there. Mm -hmm. Saw the same thing with Taffy that we you saw earlier. Yeah. Not what I saw a month ago, but yeah. I'm not going to panic. No. And sometimes the threat of all these emails, you can almost write, there's a little panic in some of these people. No, Not panic, but like, they're worried. hey, they're how worried. come? Hey, how come? Yeah. You know? 
And I know enough to just be patient and, yeah. you know, what, she'll be what she's going to be if I put the work into her. Yeah, and the only thing so they know what we're seeing is in her search, her hunt. Right. It's on and it's off. And on it's and on off. and it's off. Right. And it's sporadic. It's not maintained throughout the course of a right. whole hike around. And there's no training command fix for that. Oh. It, uh, Got to come from within. And I've seen that with enough other, uh, other dogs and they just, they, they grow through that. As they mature and gain more experience, more bird contact, more time, and uh, she was, she'll come through that. Yeah. Or I always hunt her in bird-rich country. <laughs> keep it going. No. And keep it going. She'll 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 do just fine. Right. Um, and then what did we do? We took out that little short hair. Yeah, a little puppy. With the, very fur. I think it was the third bird, second the, bird I'd ever seen. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, third. Your your your, your, uh, your step child, your stepson, my, my foster foster, foster child, foster foster, foster child puppy. No, yeah. no, then we took two setters out. We took your year old setter. The, the out. twelve month old. We started with her, just kind of show you where she's at in terms of her development, hunting wise, handling wise, pattern wise, and um, we might, if we have time when we're done with this, I'll show you a little couple other things I'm doing with her. Right. Just so you can get a feel for where my focus is. You know, we talk about it a bunch, but it's right. nice to put your eyes on it. Oh, it, with the first. 12 months, or right. 10 months, I should say. Get him at 8 weeks old. Right. She just had her 12-month first birthday yeah. like two weeks ago. So. Yeah. And to see where she's at. and Like you yeah. said, she she came on for you partly because of bird numbers out west, but she came on this spring. This spring more than season. anything. Yeah. Like, boom. Yeah. You right started before the seeing, quiet season. You started seeing everything. I, got, I was able to get her into enough grouse and woodcock right. this spring that, man, everything just really took off for her. So. And then what was the last dog we took out? Who was that? So that was a dog that is pretty well finished, and we were the plan was I'm starting. This is a dog I finished all the way out, stayed a wing shot in fall, and I'm starting to let her to relax into when she sees a bird killed, self-release. So not release mm-hmm. on gunfire alone, right. but if she sees that bird coming down uh, you know, at this right. stage of the game, and at any point I could stop her if I didn't want her to go right. to the woe command. Because your woe is yeah, not solid. I just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. And um, it didn't work out. The in- first barrel was intentionally in the air. Second one, um, I can claim partial equipment failure on that, can I, for that miss? I don't Bird so. was about 45 yards. It was a long shot. And after I pulled the trigger, the fore end of my gun was gone. So I got to yeah. have at least a 50% equipment <laughs> malfunction disclaimer but on that miss bird. The dog stood through both shots. Right. Be- watched the bird light into a tree about 130 yards away. Mm-hmm. Never budged. Just stood there, yeah. And was able to be released Without a chase. Yeah, and we went the other direction. No, and we looked for a gun there. stock, and we looked <laughs> forearm for... That dog was up... Standing. I'm standing for a long yeah. time. Yeah. I bet you four or five minutes. Yeah, and she's been that way for a while now, yeah. and I know it's cemented in. And that's why at this point, I don't see the harm if she sees that bird come down, go get her. And that's because her retrieving in the last year right. has really come on right. fantastic for a, a setter. That's never had any of the trained retrieve stuff. Right. I mean, she's retrieving as good as any dog out there. That's the what. That's what our intention was. That's too. what our intention was. I wanted you to see. Uh, uh, be patient. Take your time. Yeah. Let, develop the dog. And just because they're not retrieving at one doesn't mean they right. never will. And before we get into the, I, I got an email. This fella. This fella wrote. He even sent us a picture of his dog. Cool. At point. Okay. This. This fella. Aaron wrote us on the last batch of puppy owners mm-hmm. with those typical "how come my dog's not doing this yet" type of question, and you answer it, and I I can, I can almost remember your answer to it, and it says this might be late for the upcoming questions with Justin, but wanted to share this with you as an update. I wrote in for the last one about my eight-month-old setter who would try to eat quail but yet not pick up a pheasant. Oh, yeah, Justin, I, remember, I remember the question right. now. Yep. Justin suggested to just keep hunting the dog. <laughs> we ended the season in Kansas over the weekend with a couple of quail retrieves to hand and a couple of memorable pheasant retrieves yeah. a little earlier in the season. Nice. He took nice. your advice. He did, good. He didn't, he didn't try to jump into something else. Yeah. You said keep hunting it. Yeah, This guy's very happy. But yeah. now he says... Looking forward to some steadiness work this sure. off season. Sure, and and that's a pretty good progression to have. Yeah. You yeah. know, first season it's about gaining experience with mm-hmm. it. That's great. Right. I mean, here's a dog that's trying to eat a bird. You said just keep hunting. Mm-hmm. 
he did it and didn't I bet you the dog even could read it in him like sure. he's, not, he's not even excited if I'm doing this anymore I guess I'll bring it to him yeah <laughs> you know and pup, that's you think about it too puppy hard that's what I've always called it puppy hard mouth yeah. the very first few birds especially if they're little like quail that they're getting their mouth on oh, yeah. you'll see some of that yeah and they almost all I would say 90% of them will just will, they will grow out of that right they will right yeah. and, and you can make too much like you were telling don't make a lot out of this no not it's a, yet. It's a puppy. And if yeah. we do need to jump in there and do something training wise, <clears throat> we will. Right. We can. But <clears throat> we don't, when they're that right. young, they're still unfolding. Every hunt, they're they're yeah. changing. Yeah. And I think just the lesson there is like, not. I'm not saying that Justin's always right. No, not but, even close. <laughs> but, but your suggestion, it's like. For a suggestion to work, I love the fact that somebody took the suggestion to heart. Yeah. Because how many people you have come in, you give them homework to do, they don't really do it. Well, and in this case... Or it's hard to do. You know, just like pointing, retrieving is a genetic instinct. Yeah. And it's and it's it's in a state of change with a puppy that's going through its very first season. Yeah. So, okay, chomping on some, not retrieving some... There are people out there who probably would have told him, you need to force train that dog to right. retrieve, okay? Right. I don't recommend that for a dog that young that's just starting because right. many times this is exactly what will happen. Right. Now, if indeed we do need to do that to remedy these, if right. either of those were per- to, to persist, right. well, we can do that at any time later. Right. Um, and I think it's always better to do it with a dog that's a little bit older, has yep. more obedience on it. Yep. Yep. So. Used to thing. Used to learning. Yeah. And, yep. and, and has been hunted. I think yep. that's a good prerequisite to the trained retrieve. So you go on the record as saying hunting is important. Yes. That's a, <laughs> All that's, right. It's very. All right. Let's get to them. Okay. All right. This one's uh, from Bill. I, I stumbled onto your podcast. I'll save all. Been in the Army the last 27 years. And with all the moves and deployment, never had time to train a bird dog. Although he did have a German Shepherd that retrieved ducks better than most of my friends' hunting dogs. I love that. Yeah. (laughs) Bring your Shepherd. (laughs) Um, Last assignment near Williamsburg, Virginia. Maybe I'll run into the guy if I go to Virginia. Um, Have a -a two-and-a-half-year-old Springer who I have trained with the help of a buddy who has trained Drothars for years and also joined the Chesapeake chapter of NAVDA. Well, good for you. I'm glad of that. Who have been very supportive I do get a few looks when I tell him I have a Springer. Uh, most assume he's a small monster lander. I can see that sometimes. Oz has been hunted great the last two seasons. He's not finished yet, but has a great nose. Awesome at finding birds. Retrieving on land or water. I'll take the dog right now. This off season, I'm going to work on getting him steady to flush and shot. My question, what breed or breeds would you recommend I look for for a second dog? I hunt waterfall fowl more than anything. Uh, I hunt doves several times and go to preserves, chuckers and pheasants, four to six times a year. Just discovered some places to woodcock hunt. I know where he's at then. <laughs> so there's only 12 woodcock in Virginia. I know where they go. <laughs> and uh, uh, plan on hunting several of those next year. Once retired, I want to venture out and hunt some wild birds. My springer does great, loves the water, and this year found and retrieved every bird I shot. When I took him, only issue I have with the breed is he is... Not built for cold weather duck hunting. So if it's below 33, I normally leave it at home. Hate to see him shivering in the blind. That's nice. Uh, since I waterfall hunt more than anything else, you may be inclined to say get a lab or chessy, but I already know I don't want either. <laughs> I am looking for a mid-sized dog that likes water work. I'm primarily a hunter, but like to like to try training a dog for the NAVDA test. I'm also I am I'm a year or two away from my next pup. I want to retire from the army first. Look for breeds. Would appreciate your thoughts. Breed. What's a good fit for me? Hmm. <clears throat> think? Labra Chessy. No. Well. No. I, 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 yeah. I, yeah. My first recommendation would have been but a lab. Yeah. But, you know, he doesn't want one. He right, doesn't right. want one. So my only concern, it sounds like he has a good dog just other than the cold, cold issue. Cold, cold. And so once we go into the world of continental pointing breeds. Right. That would be the right fit for that. I, there are going to be some that 
also will not maybe have the coat to handle below 33 it's, degrees. Exactly. There's not a lot of uniformity always in those litters. Right. And right. so he easily, if he, so let's run down the list of potential candidates. What do you got? Wire hair, Grothar, Griffon, yeah. Poodle Pointer. Poodle Pointer, yeah. yeah. I know them to all be pretty good working dogs, mm-hmm. cold weather. I, I've known a few to break skim ice. Mm-hmm. But again, I, I think you're asking a lot to if you're if you're going to be that cold, ice, that, that cold. Um, he already think, has a good warmer water duck dog. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. he wants a pointing dog. So. Yeah, no, you're right. You can't. You cannot. Unless somebody was lion breeding for like cold weather versatile hunting dogs, like <laughs> can almost guarantee you that this brup is going to love cold water. It's a gamble. So whatever breed he on the coat on the coat, yeah, right. I mean, right. you're not always going to be able to see no. at eight weeks old. This is the one that's going to have right. that ideal coat right. for the cold water. You know, I would probably go I, myself. I would probably go. Um, I would probably go toward the Drothar yeah. line because they pay more attention to the coat than the the rest of the breed registries do because of the rules there is to breed your dog. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, he's going to get a coat and confirmation test. They're not going to let that parent. They're not going to let a slick coat breed to another slick coat. They're not going to let a woolly coat. They're always trying to get that dual coat. Mm-hmm. I, I had one black wire hair named Hasco that he go into the water, come back out, and he shed water like a like yeah. a chessy. Yeah. Just boom, one shake. Dry. Dry. He had yeah. that super wire coat and an undercoat. Mm-hmm. But boy, the rest of the litter didn't. Yeah. You know? So I don't know if we can answer that question. What do you think? I think... He's got, he doesn't want so we're crossing off the lab. Yeah, he wants the yeah. he wants a versatile. I would dog. I would be totally comfortable with a drought there yeah. and you know just cross your fingers on that you're going to get the right. coat. I know that dog if he gets a good one, it's going to do the job in the uplands that he wants. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you're probably going to get your your best coat. I'm guessing. Okay. From, yeah, that's that's. There. I'm going to go with that one. Drought there. Yeah. Um, let him get used to your other dog first though, just in case. Um, all right, Matthew writes in, thanks for the podcast, got stationed in Hawaii, hardship tour, I guess, for three years, another service guy, we put the, Justin Always. put, Justin put the, uh, the, our service guys, top, top of, of the list. list, top of the list, um, got inspired to buy another shotgun, painted the butt here, and went out a few times, dogless, got skunked, but had a great time, maybe too late for Justin, but or Justin's podcast, but when I come back to the mainland, I was thinking of getting a started broke dog. Feel it might just be better with a young kid in limited time. Wondering about your opinions and Justin's opinions on that. My dad got two started dogs growing up, a pointer who was okay, but the guy worked with us a little bit. He recently got a German short hair um, before I left, who's fantastic, but I really think it has more to do with the genetics, which we don't, which we don't have his pedigree. Um, the guy we got the GSP from was a total flake when we had questions. Welcome but, to the dog world. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that classic. Yeah. yeah, I remember when I picked up a dog, I thought it was at the, Mun- the Herman Munster, Herman Lily Munster's house. Um, but it really didn't matter because he hunted so well, he was up to our. So, what's your opinion on started broke dogs? Yeah, it can, it can be a good decision for certain people. Mm-hmm. I think the pros are. You sure kind of have a better idea what you're getting into than an eight-week-old puppy, unless you're really familiar with the line. Yeah. And I mean, beyond asking, you know, the owner or mom, is she a good dog? I mean, really having yeah. known how they hunt and and what they're like and, yep. and how they train and everything. So that's the plus. Um, the downside can be. Sometimes the reason the dog is offered for sale is also a reason that kind of is, you wouldn't want it too. And right. Unfortunately. And those not, could be things like a runaway dog. Well, I, he would be, hope not. Well. Who knows. But it. I know a lot of people got rid of runaway dogs. Yeah. And not everyone that has a started dog offered for sale is unfortunately 100% upfront about all the reasons. Right. You know, they might just tell you the ones you want to hear. And that's why I always advocate if you're considering a started dog, you go watch it work. You mm-hmm. like what you see. Mm-hmm. If you want to proceed, 
you write a check with the understanding that you get a two-week trial period with this dog so you really have a chance to go work him a few more times get to know him if you have you know see right. how he's going to be at the rest of the right. fit for you two weeks is a fair time for a dog to settle in and acclimate yeah. to the new stuff um and with and also with the understanding that hey if something happens to this dog while he's in my care i just bought him oh yeah and yeah, you yeah. ask the guy hold the check right. for two weeks i'll call you and give you the a or nay on it and i don't yeah. think if someone's not willing to do that for you to me that would be a little bit of a red flag yeah because i think i would hope they would want the dog to be the right fit for the dog and the person yeah yeah, yeah. Well, you know ideal situation yeah good. so as long as you approach the start of dog purchase from that angle that you have right. a two-week safety net here to yeah. really check out, make sure that there aren't any holes that maybe weren't yeah. uh, somebody was up front about. Yeah. It, but it can be a good way. Most of those are well, going to be kennel dogs, but... but I'll, They can transition. The they, majority of them. They like to transition into yeah, house dogs. Absolutely. They love it. Yeah. You know, yeah. when you said that, it made me think of what I told a guy a month ago or so. He couldn't decide on a breed. And I said, you know what you should do? And tell me if you think this is a bad idea. And you can say, Ron, that was the dumbest thing I ever heard. Which, you know, you can say to me. You know, I'm thick skinned. I said, why don't you find a breeder nearby you, or a few of them, and get in, get, if they're good breeders, and, tra- and most of breeders are in hunting dog world are some form of trainers, most of them. If you really like and click with this guy, get that dog, get that guy's dog breed. I mean, if you, if you can't make your mind up on what dog, Make your mind up on a guy that you feel comfortable with, yeah. who's going to kind of mentor you and help you and be able to take that phone call from you. And how many times have I suggested to people when we're doing this together, you know, find, track down somebody who does the kind of hunting you do? Yeah, you've said that. All the time. Right. That, you know, because genetically, you it's better to start as close to your goal as you can. Yeah. <laughs> Why well, don't leave yourself a, a gap that is wide as a Grand Canyon to try and train your way across, up, you know? Really. Yeah. And so get genetically as close to your goal as you can yeah. and make your training fun and easy. Yeah. Um, and, and the guys who are into that kind of hunting, right. they are going to have gravitated to right. dogs that are ideal for that. Yeah. And let the breed be what it is. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and just the, the last expound on that is, so if you f- if you follow that advice, find the breeder. If you're not in a hurry, let find a few people in your area. Tell them what you don't don't wait to see one for sale. Yeah. Tell the guy. Guy comes to you, Justin. Hey, if I know you see a lot of dogs, if you hear one that's for sale that you think there might be another way to do it too. Yeah. You it, it, the breed will be a roll of the dice, but the guy you ask. Tell him that like you want to be on the list for a started dog. Yeah, and he he might find you one. Sure, you know. Yeah, and be patient. Yeah, that's the best thing. Have a clear picture of what you want, yeah. and and be patient. Or, you know, if he's considering the puppy route, he's going to want to do some homework. You just don't have the safety now. You know, when right you, at, at eight weeks, it is what it is when they grow up. And but I'd say the pros outweigh the cons. Myself, I don't. I you don't think they outweigh it. I I enjoy raising puppies. I really do. I've gotten a few good dogs from people that were a year old. Right. They weren't fitting for them for whatever. Yeah, yeah. But I could see the potential in them. Yeah. And, and, well, you, maybe you just and the like nice this. thing is they're ready to train. Right. If they, they've yeah, yeah. And the guys I bought them from know how to raise dogs. They raise them right. Right. And they just weren't fitting their program. So. All right. 50-50 program. Yeah. All right. All right. I, I'm sucker for puppies. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, Case writes... Uh, well, Case writes twice and tells me his name. Uh, Case... From Colorado, member of Rocky Mountain Chapter. Boy, we're getting a lot of nav to stuff here. This is really yeah. taking off here. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got a one-year-old poodle pointer getting ready to run his natural ability test. I wanted to say thank you much for doing your podcast. I learned a lot from it. I'm an equipment operator, so I have a chance to listen a lot during the day. I believe I've listened to every episode. Ooh, there's a question here at the end. As much as, as much an in, indictment of how much I hate the radio... As is a compliment to your show. Okay, well, this is making me feel really fluffy. Thank you. Thank you, Chase. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, oh, here's the question. This is my first dog. First test. All of that. I hate clubs, and I'm pretty stubborn. Okay. <laughs> you must be German. Um, but to some extent, you convinced me that I should just want that I should pay attention. There's a really a lot to think about that I didn't expect. So without a life story, thank you very much. Looking forward to more daytime radio filler. 
Oh, it was just a big complimentary. There isn't a question. No, in there, there isn't a question no. in there. It was a compliment. Oh, wow. kind of. God, well, what, yeah. It would basically well, it's, it was, it was better than the radio. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a compliment. Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks. Thanks for saving that one. You could have threw that one in a can, but <laughs> kept hey, waiting thanks, for Chase. the question. There wasn't one. Equipment operator. That's that means you weren't nice smart enough to be a millwright or an electrician, and they let you drive a bulldozer. <laughs> oh boy, that was mean. That was a hundred percent you. <laughs> that was mean. <laughs> um, all right, Joe writes. Uh, cent- I live in Central Illinois. Seven. Uh, German white-haired pointer, seven years old. A GSP, six years old, living in Illinois, few opportunities to hunt wild birds. For the last seven hunting seasons, we have been on one wild bird hunt. They've all been pay and take, Des Plaines, Silver River. These are, for people who don't know what these are, the state releases in big tracts of land pheasants. Public ground, state Public ground, run, state run. Like once a week, right. they re- go release some pheasants. Or right, whatever. right. Yeah. I grew up on the Iroquois one. That's okay. where all my early hunting. Okay. And it's actually, it's not like going to Pine Hill. It, it's it's a little tougher. I mean, you're fe- you feel a little bit more like a wild bird hunt. Or, Birds aren't wild, but the the I, the terrain's wild. I came along too late. Michigan tried that for a little bit, you know, I, but I heard all the back. stories. The, the release coming birds? back this year. Yep. Oh, I had the guy on my show. I had some guys tell me about that. You know, like twenty vehicles waiting for it to get light. Dogs running all yeah. over the places. I, I'm glad I was born too late. To <laughs> you know what? The state runs it way different than that, though. Sure. I don't know how Michigan ran it back in the day. I don't either. But it was you had a spot to hunt to start off with, and then after the first two hours, you could wander around two thousand acres. Mm. So they okay. they kept that to a minimum. Good. Anyway, so. Uh, I have made a commitment to travel outside of Illinois to hunt wild birds. I have heard on some previous podcasts that Justin had been pretty much all around the United States hunting birds. Through all of Justin's bird hunting experience, what has he learned to keep in his first aid bag for dogs? Good question. It's a great question. What do you keep in your first it's aid bag? We never talked about I, that. You know what? When we... I skip. thought he was going to ask for your best hunting spot. That <laughs> <laughs> changes all the time. <laughs> um... That is a great question. Yeah. Yeah. And and when I flipped through these real quick, kind of skimming what we had coming, I, I didn't want to go afterwards. Oh, I forgot to tell him I have that in there. So yeah. I actually grabbed what I have right here. I oh. got it in my office. So I have two, two kits. No kidding. So this is a little one that I keep right on me in the field, in my in my in vest, Tupperware. In, in my pack. Well, yeah, I keep everything together. Nice so I got a little enjoy. pouch in my vest that yep. just rides around in. So that's all hunting licenses. Yeah, that should licenses. be good. You, you should have, have Yeah, you need to be legal. All right. Toilet paper. To- <laughs> that's, man, you always have that on your oh. field. Oh, there's your communion ring. <laughs> Hemostat. Hemostat. Um, basic bandaging material. Um, you know, gauze, tape. Um, and I, you never used to carry that on me in the field. It's always been in my truck kit. And right. I had a dog in Kansas one time clip a barbed wire fence, which is not uncommon at all. But right. what was abnormal is that barb pierced the main bleeder in her front leg there. Like, Ooh. yes, the one your veterinarian takes a blood draw. Right, that right. One, that right? And I, I didn't think I was going to be able to get that stopped. Wow. I thought I could not get it stopped, get it and put pressure on it. I mean, we're talking about, and every time I'd relieve the pressure, here it'd come again. Wow. And so I ended up having a Boy Scout, like uh, literally pocket knife, cut off a piece of my t shirt, yeah. wrapped so I could get some pressure on there, a piece right. of a boot lace to kind of get some. Yeah. So you should have something there for that. That kind of wrap. Yep. Yeah. The rest they kind of refer to it as vet wrap, don't they? Well, that's the elasticy, sticky well, that kind work, of. Uh, that works great for yeah. that for the last outer wrap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That that helps you keep pressure on a wound. The rest is really more for people. I got some guys get blisters and stuff like that. Got a little multi tool in there. Uh, What's the hypodermic tool? for? You don't have any. Um, what do you got a hypodermic in there. That for? so I carry on me right there too. This is injectable Benadryl in case oh. of, uh, snake bite. Okay, that would be my first line of action. Should I have a dog struck by a rattlesnake? Yeah, get, get them cooled down, get their heart rate down, put injectable Benadryl in them, get them in, get them in and watch them. Bet. Yeah. So nothing crazy, nothing fancy. Nope. Just says you're not going to do any stitching out in the field. No, no, no. So you're that just, is the on me. Your wife's job. In the in the. <laughs> On me in the field, and then this is what I have for the truck. This this is the size of a bass fisherman's 
tackle, tackle box. box. It does actually. It is a it plain is a tackle, old tackle it box. It is a tackle box. And so, oh my lord! And here's what we got. So, um, I got some of your basic antibiotics. Yeah. Because um, a lot of times I would want to start something before I'm able to. It's not an emergency, right? Right. I'll get in when I can get in, but I may want to start. Get ahead on the program, antibiotics. Get ahead on that, and always consult your vet so you know you're giving them the right thing for what you're dealing with. Be nice to know um, a vet personally. And well, everyone who owns a dog knows a vet. And so you but I mean, to, get to know him personally. Yeah, well, you, you need know. to talk to yeah. him and say, hey, I've, I've got a field dog. I want to be right. ready for what could happen. Um, all this other stuff, I always got peroxide on me in case I need to make a dog vomit. I do not use that for cleansing wounds. Okay. Uh, there's much better products for cleansing wounds than peroxide. Peroxide actually uh, slows down the healing process. Um I have activated charcoal and vitamin K. That would be to start uh, treatment for if a dog gets a toxin, you know. Okay. Um, always that little... How about pain, any kind of pain relief stuff? Oh, yeah, always. Yeah. Um, little topical stuff for little minor abrasions. And then in here, this box is all bandaging materials. Just extra. Staple gun, gauze, yep. vet wrap... Staple gun, um, several different syringes for flushing any kind of wounds. Yeah, yeah. It's important yeah. to get them all cleaned out. What do you use? Saline, if yeah. you have it. Um, no, there's a. They use it at the vets. It's a blue liquid. It starts with an N. It's it's almost like a betadine solution, something. but not that red Can't stuff. Remember. I think it starts with an N. They'll know if okay. you ask them. It's a, it's a wound cleanser, and then so. I try and keep everything a little bit organized. So this you is do. a this is a good thing you gotta so what do you gotta take care of in a dog in the field? You gotta take care of their feet, right? right. So you always got stuff to treat their feet. They make that pad tough, pad heel. Mm -hmm. That's good for abraded pads. Um, there's another like waxy product, they call it that musher's secret. Do you use that? Yep, I don't know if, yep. Um, and then I always have boots along in case I need to cover uh, an injury on a dog's foot. Do you typically hunt with boots on a dog? And only if I absolutely have, have to. to. Like Sandberg yeah, Country or something. Pain. Yeah. So you got to take care of their feet. And then we have stuff for eyes. Right. You want eye flush, saline eye rinse, check yep. for weed seeds and everything. Yep. But then also got a couple different kinds of medicated eye drops. Yep. You got to take well, ears. Right, you want ear rinse, yep. and then I've got some medicated ear stuff. In case of ear infections kept coming up, or could be, um, and then uh, GI stuff, um, gastrointestinal stuff. You got stuff for vomiting, diarrhea, yeah. um, and I always have some of that canned, real bland <coughs> food in case the dog gets really bad on the road. No food for 24 hours, and then bland diet and start to build them back up. Right. The pain stuff, that's going to be like um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, carprofen, remedil, yeah. and um, I got a couple other things in here that if, and, and all this stuff that I have, uh, it's all stuff, you know, I don't even tell you the name of it because right. I don't want people just giving stuff and right, everything. Right. I, yeah. Full disclosure, right? My wife's a veterinarian, so yes. I, I get on the phone. The right. most important thing with self-treating your dog is don't do anything unless you're 100% sure it's the right thing to do. You've either done it and before, you were successful. Here's the most important thing in my kit right here. Cheat sheet. Right, there. just to remember what to do. Yeah, and you is, that, is that a off. once a day or twice a day? Is that what's nah, the yeah. dose? No, 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 no. Diarrhea. Nah, nah. You know, and that and when you the one thing you have on gastric that more people have food issues on the road with dogs, sure. diarrhea issues on the road, mm -hmm. uh, bloody stools. People sometimes panic when there's a bloody stool, and some dogs get like they get bloody stools when they hunt. I've, have you seen that? This can be an indicator of stress. Right. So stress can be being hunted hard or the travel. They're yep. out of their normal yep. routine. Yep. Um, so it may not, it, you know, necessarily panic mode, but right. you, need to, you need to know your dog and know, is it is it just that? Yeah. You know, is the dog still eating? Is he still drinking? Is he still acting normal? Oh, another important thing, thinking of that, um, is his temp normal? Always be able to take your dog's temp. Yeah. If he's running a fever or something, you right. need to know that. You know, I, or if his temp's dropping, you need to know that. I haven't implemented it, but I've heard, I'm sure it was on another podcast, um, that 
it's a good idea to know. I mean, if you really want to, you know, some people like more detail than others, right? I mean, mm-hmm. they just they appreciate, you know, they're they're a little more scientific in the head than I am, but um, to know what your dog's normal temperature is. I mean, dogs are usually in There's a, a range, range, yeah, right. But when you're ex- exercising your dog in the afternoon or whatever, and he's already hot, they say take his rectal th- temperature. He's, his demeanor is fine. His lips are fine. But now he's running 103. So that's like that's be his running temperature. And then you'd have that in your head that like if I think he's too hot and I checked him up. And if you never checked his temperature and you saw 103, you might be thinking this dog needs to go to the vet right now. But if you already did that ahead of time, you'd know that when my dog exercises, hmm. he runs around 103. Hmm. So it's like it takes out one little piece of panic. Yeah. You know. But it is good to have a, you know, I've got, I've got the same thing. I've got a couple of baby thermometers. Yeah. And, and people don't be afraid of putting it in a dog's butt because they don't care. I've never seen, I've seen the fussiest dogs in the world never care about that thermometer. <laughs> you know? I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think if I left anything out. Eyes, eye flush, stuff for the feet. How about, I mean, as long as we're like on that road trip, you know, first aid kit. Do you do anything else? Do you just bring your normal dog food and on the road with you? Do you do any anything else on a hunting trip? Oh no, no. Just the only thing normal. is, yeah, I, the only thing I do out of the normal off that's different than the off season routine is I always feed wet. I'll, yeah, okay. I'll soak yeah, that yeah. food. I'll cover yeah. it up. I, I feed with water, and I, mm-hmm. you know, if they're off and just normal day to day feeding, I feed dry. Right. And when I say wet, I don't mean wet canned food I mean right, right. water yeah it and helps with absorption of the food and, yeah and it's when you're less of their own water to do that and anytime you know it helps them stay hydrated anytime right. you get water them it's a good thing when they're working right you know yeah well it's if people think about it if you feed a dog dry and I do and does them on a hunting trip the same way I, in fact I try to go into a hotel and get warm water just because it mm-hmm. makes more gravy, mm-hmm. gravy-ish for him. Especially if it's cold out. Nice hot meal. <laughs> yeah. I like the really, dogs to have a warm it? meal. Yeah. yeah. What dog wouldn't steal a hot, yeah. Yeah. you know, something off the stove? Yeah. But if you, uh, if you watch a dog that just eats dry and he runs around a little bit, he's used a lot of his moisture just to process that dry kibble. Mm-hmm. It's pulling from his body sure. into his intestines. So if you already give him the water in the kibble, it's not putting a demand on the dog's natural amount of hydration yeah and on a hunting trip most people are transporting their yeah. dogs in a crate or a trailer or dog box of yeah. some fashion everything oh yeah so they do not have access to water like they do All at home long. around the house and at the kennels where they mm-hmm. can come and go from it so anytime you can get water in your dog yeah. it's good no yeah. i agree so to wrap up that guy's uh, first aid kit, I, I would go to your veterinarian and say, I'm going to be in the field. Can you please help me put together mm-hmm. the basics that I need right. could need while I was right. in there until I can get the dog yeah. to get help? And, and I know there are some commercially ready-to-buy, already oh, yeah, yeah. put-together ones. Oh, yeah. Too. You can find them. You yeah. can probably go to PetSmart and find one. But I would go with one of the hunting dog supply yeah. companies before okay. I'd okay. buy a kit from Pet PetSmart. Well, that's just to fix your loss of ops. Yeah. Alright. <laughs> hey Ron, this is Nick. I already spoke to you about six months ago. Thanks again about the information for Navda. I'm t- Navda better start giving me a cut of these people. You are signing I, up some new I, members, aren't I you? Am, I am gonna, This is getting ridiculous. Uh, ridiculous. Quite an ambassador. My question for Justin is on digging. <laughs> you should ask me about that. Uh, One year old Brittany named Chief that won't quit digging holes. In the yard, I know I can solve this with electricity, but he's smart enough to know not to dig when I'm with inside of him. Any other tricks, tips, or ideas on digging? I don't. I don't. <laughs> other than try and wear him down, you know. Usually, digging, barking, chewing. A lot of times, that's boredom or right. excess energy with right. a dog. But some dogs just like to dig. They do, yeah. and uh, I, I don't. I don't know. I, I had one guy tell me that uh, he set some rat traps. He in a in a hole the dog had already dug, just like a garbage can and, trap, and just really lightly kind mm-hmm. of covered him with dirt there. Every and he time. knew that dog was going to redig that hole, mm-hmm. and uh, so he said he was so proud of himself. You know, he had his, his set, the, yeah. the traps were set, and he 
watching out the window. That's the dog back out in the yard. And sure enough, eventually he comes back around that hole and sniffed. And he starts to dig in one of those traps. Snap! You know, like that. <laughs> and he said, my dog thought that was the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> he said completely backfired on him. He said, I thought it would scare him or pinch right. his toes or nothing. He said, I think like Chill. snap and came fine. He picked it up and run around the yard. He said, it. So I, I really don't know what to tell this guy. It's not something. In yeah, my, I, I, I think the only thing you could do is you have to set, you'd have to just set it up and work at it and work at it. And I'm telling you, like you said, dog either going to be in a kennel or not. Cause mm. it's gonna, if you're going to give him the yard, he's going to dig. You know? Eventually, he's bored. Yeah, he's bored. He might he might grow out of it. I, like he said, he could you know do a little e collar stuff, but that requires his supervision. Yeah. You know, and yeah, so yeah. at best case scenario, there is the dog won't do it when you're watching, probably. <laughs> right. Right. I don't. Right. Sorry, nothing we can help perfectly with that one. Um, we better not try to fool this guy. He's a professor. Okay. All right. All right. So. Um, Oh, that's right. He's a professor of anthropology. He doesn't know nothing about dogs. We're okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know about that. Um, Justin, what are some good ways to train a pointing dog for quail that tend to run? I hunt a lot of gambles quail in Arizona. <gasps> okay. And I've heard about that. I've never sure. been down there. You, yeah. you go there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one-year-old GWP. She just turned one last week. Had a great first season. Gamble burned. Blues. Pheasants. Chucker. She woes and is starting to learn back. But... Hunting a lot of gambles, so... Do you live there, is this, I think? Yeah, yeah. He does, okay. Yeah. Northern Arizona. Beautiful. Uh, what's a good way to train a pointing dog for quail that tend to run? So, he lives in the right place. Dogs are going to get good at that, doing that, hunting, running birds. Right. That's how, there is not a good... Okay, we're going to set this up. This is a training right. scenario, you know. Right. He's going to get good at running birds, working running birds. Mm-hmm. The birds are he that dog will learn what works and what doesn't. Right. And he's going to fail many times. The birds are going to ditch him or he's going to be working on figuring out which way they went and stumble into him and bump yeah. him. That's all part of a bird dog learning how to do that. Yeah. But as time goes on, and that's why I asked, does he live there? Because yeah. he'll, he'll be able to afford that dog a lot of opportunity. Right. Where it's difficult is if a guy lives in a different part of the country, hunts gambles quail one week a year, that's the only experience right. the dog's getting. But he lives where they live. and so The dog should pretty much learn to If hate. it's a well-bred dog and has the right instincts, right. then the more he hunts them on there. And it sounds like you know a young dog, first season, was sounded successful, yeah. somewhat good. He might be like our first opening. He might have nothing to worry about. I, I, so far, it doesn't sound like he does. Yeah. But there is no phony baloney, okay, we're going to set up this, how to track a run and covey a gamble, how to handle those right. training scenarios. And those birds, just for edification for me and everybody else, that is their modus operandi. Those kind of quail yeah. almost always run. Yeah, I mean they're gonna. But you know, there a lot of it's cover related, hunting pressure related. But gambles and scaled quail are known for to, to for having some traction on you. them. Sure, yeah. especially scalies. Maybe you should get a too. flushing dog. <laughs> it wouldn't be a bad way to hunt them if you knew where they were. <laughs> if you knew where they country, were, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, Steve writes in. Uh, thank you for taking time to read the question. He's 28 years old. I've hunted pheasants and quail with my father and our GSP since I was able to hold a shotgun. Dad owns a small kennel, and he and I have bred and sold black and white GSPs since I was a young boy. My Mm. wife and I were gifted a GSP as a wedding gift from my father. We hunted our first season last year. Good population of wild birds. He's a a one-and-a-half-year-old male that hunts hard, sleeps in our bed. Not by my choice. (laughs) My wife is in charge and eats like a horse. We, so far, it's a German short hair. We have some things to polish up this summer, but generally doing pretty well in pointing, retrieving, and tracking. I've always hunted dogs that were steady to wing. Could you elaborate on the pros and cons of steady to wing shot and fall, as well as training tips regarding steadiness? <clears throat> I've come to the realization that we as handlers need more training than dogs usually do. Any advice would be appreciated. The pros and cons of steady to wing shot and fall. Yeah. <laughs> we won't beat it to death because I know we have before. The only con would be maybe um, 
there are guys that will make an argument, I think, sometimes that holds Pheasant hunters some water. Pheasant make. hunters usually one yep. that, you know, when, when that gun goes off and that bird is coming down, mm-hmm. a, a dog on the way is a good thing. Yeah, especially yeah. with the wild rooster. Sure, and, I, mean, and, I, and I can't argue any bird that's that. going to get away from a dog. You no, know, there's other birds that are tough cripple recoveries, too, and a lot of it depends on the terrain, terrain. and the sure. cover sure. where that bird's fallen. And so I can go along with that. I, I've seen it. Yeah. You know, I think that dog that's, you know, on its way or there as that bird's coming down isn't a bad thing. Right. Um, and I have to, I think we have to do this here on this one because I keep hearing it, keep hearing it, keep hearing it. A lot of people use the term steady to wing to mean that the dog breaks when the bird flushes. I hear it all the time. They think that's, that's steady to wing. Too, yeah. That's not no, to me steady to wing is means watching a bird watching fly. the bird fly off. Right. He, that means he doesn't move until the gun goes off. Right. If you don't shoot, the dog right. is still standing. Right. But many people use that term to describe mm-hmm. a dog that holds until the bird takes right. wing and maybe there's some confusion there. It's right, not right. steady till wing. It's right. steady to wing. It means no moving unless a gun goes off. Right. And I don't know what he's talking about there, but just for clarification, right, right. the pros to being steady to wing, um, you're not going to get screened by a dog on a low flying bird. He's staying put where he was pointing. Nope. And when there's more than one bird in front of that dog, when he doesn't, if he breaks and chases the first one, he doesn't run the rest of them up when he does that. Yeah. There's your there's your two biggest that's, pluses that's to have good a dog co- or two stay good put. pros. Yep. Sure. Yep. And 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 marking a fall. If, if it was a single bird shot, mm-hmm. if the dog's not running, he's probably watching that bird. Here's been my observation on marking as it relates to steadiness. Okay. I don't know that it matters. I think the dog's marking ability, he's either is or he isn't very, very good at it. And mm-hmm. whether he breaks at any point in the process doesn't I've seen dogs that were completely steady and they're terrible markers okay. they just are I'll give you that right they're just not good at marking shot birds in regard, irregardless right. of their level of steadiness and, and some do- dogs you've seen that fantastic markers right. regardless of when they break they're within a stone's throw I feel like the marking is its own thing its own thing that so doesn't necessarily have, have a to correlation to no they're just good at it <laughs> yeah yeah okay they're, they're good at no one it's right there yeah yeah okay. so many more pros than the one little con oh I think steady to wing I don't think you can make an argument that it's not worth doing right. other than if you just want to be honest with yourself and say I don't want to do extra work right because right. you better believe it's extra work for a dog to stand right. there like a statue and watch him birds fly out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but I feel the payoff is that you will kill more birds with a dog that's steady to wing. That will create more shooting opportunities for you. There you go. Yeah. Um, and as far as a training tip regarding steadiness, we'd have to go into the whole... Whoa. A tra- yeah. Perfect whoa training. Perfect whoa training. Yeah, I mean, that's your foundation for like it. Like we did with that three-year-old setter today. Yeah. Running through the field and... And you didn't scream it out. You didn't go, whoa! You just told the dog, whoa, and the dog, you swore the dog smelled a bird. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take anything out of the dog. You know, the dog's tail was, I mean, it was It's not a dirty word. No, and it was just in the minute you said, okay, back back to hunting. Yeah, if you can't stop your dog at a dead run in the hunting environment with obedience, whoa, command. (laughs) No, because you've got massive temptation yeah. in the picture yeah. but you start there yeah. with that perfect obedience woe and then you build on that yeah. and you gradually add yeah. things one at a time but so that woe is just you gotta that's the foundation for it's anything. gotta almost look like a magic show you're that it, you it, want it that good you want it you want it as close to perfect saw. as you can get it yeah yeah, yeah. okay um, I don't have a name on a guy but uh, worst training mistake He's ever made with a dog or a woman. <laughs> That's a good one. I didn't see this one come through. Uh, you know, there might be a reason there's not a name on Maybe. that because you know it kind of smells a little bit like someone who might know me. Uh oh. <laughs> no, I don't know. I could be wrong. <laughs> oh boy, how do I? So worst training mistake. Yeah. Um, I'm. I'm, I'm gonna just. It, Guess it came when you were early on in your training. It did. As a trainer. It did. I remember because when I flipped through there, I had to think about this a little bit. I 
steer clear of the one thing. <laughs> the only dog peril I can think one time I invested far too long with a woman that was fundamentally flawed. <laughs> and uh, So don't do that with a dog. If the flaws are not capable of changing, move on. Right. I sent her back to her breeder. and uh, So we'll, well, that's the end of that part. Yeah, we got so the woman part. The worst there. training mistake I ever made. I think the one, you know... I have never, in all these years and all these dogs, I've never made a bird problem. Never. Even early on. And I feel that's that's really a a credit to the pro that I was mentored by and that I got my start with. Because, you know, I tell people, look, if you can make a lot of mistakes, but you don't want to make them with birds or guns. Right. You know, we can probably get through about anything else. Yeah. But... I've never made a bird work problem, and I think that's because of how I learned to do it right. and the fact that I don't push. And I'm not a heavy correction or heavy-handed trainer, right? right. So all those things combined together, right. it's that everything I do with bird work is a very safe way to do it. Right. You know, you may not have unbelievable results in a crazy short period of time, but you're never going to do any harm right. doing it my way. Right. And, and I'm a patient guy. I'm a take my time kind of trainer. And it's like yeah. it's not how fast you get there. It's not w- what route you took there that's right. important. It's that you got there. Keep your eyes. Keep you're your going. eye on important. Yeah, yeah. The one I would have to say did involve a shot. It did it was a gun problem, and it was 100 percent my fault. Oh and, really? Yep. And I were right. It was early in my career. It was during my time in Oregon. So that would have been put me in my mid twenties, probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. 20 years ago. Yeah. And um, he's a young male wire hair, fantastic dog. Um, tons of point, tons of drives, real leggy, racy male, and really smart, really trainable. He was coming along re- just great. Yeah. And, uh, but we were crowding the hunting season. And so I had done a lot of blank, and I know this guy really wanted, he wanted to go on the opener with this pup and everything else. And, and I did a bunch of blank gun work. That looked good. And did some shotgun work, kind of at a distance while he was chasing. I was, tr- I figured he was ready to have bird shot over him, and I wanted to start shooting birds over this dog so that I, this guy could have him ready to go by opening You're weekend. To all, do what you can. Yeah, but all dumb stuff, right? Looking back on it, um, that was going on his timetable and and not the dog's, and so. I felt the dog was ready to have some bird shot over him, and I was using chuckers, pen race chuckers, preseason, and uh, flushed a bird in front of a point. And of course, he's a young dog, so he broke and he chased. And I had a safe shot, but it sure enough was right over the top of him. Mm. And I shot, and when that gun went off, that dog acted looked like he ran into an invisible brick wall. I mean, just hit the brakes. His ears were pinned back, you know, his whole demeanor. And my heart just sank. I went, what did I just do? I just made this guy's dog gunshot. Oh, oh my gosh. And um, so I, I got him out of there. I kind of got him to loose up. I went on with the run and took about a route that took me about 15, 20 minutes to get back to the truck. And he gradually loosened up and started to hunt again and look around. Back to the truck, we're out of here. Um, I went back to a place that I had worked him a lot more than that place. And, and on that note, I, could, I would never, ever, ever go back to where that happened. That will always be a bad spot in that right. dog's brain, right? right. And that, that place is done. Yeah. Went back to where I had some foundation with some shooting. Fortunately, I, this is, I got lucky. I had enough bird dog there to, to pull him. He, to pu- get- he pulled himself through it. He got through it because there was enough drive in that right. dog, and there was enough bird dog in that dog. That's no credit to Just what right. I did to fix my but mistake. That was your worst. <laughs> but I, I, got, I got lucky that there was enough dog there. I got him back through the gun stuff. I started shooting over him. Here's the funny part about this. Not funny, but... Um, ironic. Ironic is I really came out of this, and, and I at full, I I told the owner everything that happened because right. I told him I need some more time with this dog. Here's what happened. I made a mistake. I thought he was ready. He wasn't. Here's what he did. Here's what I'm doing. Um, from that day on, that dog never chased another bird at the flush. He, it, was the, oh. it was the unintentional 
uh, temporary gun shyness, steady to wing. And, <laughs> and what what the, was going on in the dog's head is he didn't want to get in front of that gun. Right. No, it's it's like uncomfortably right. loud up there, and he'd stand and watch out, and pow, shoot those birds, and wham, off he'd go and retrieve them, bring them back. But it's a great retriever, right? But he didn't right. want to get in that front of that oh, gun man. anymore. Now, as he was hunted, he started I'm to sure. a little bit and everything. Yeah. Um, so that was it. I pushed for more than the dog. I thought he was ready. He wasn't. I pushed in the gun department. I made a problem. The only thing that saved me was, was the dog. dog. Yeah. 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 I got lucky. And you probably had the right breed. It's wire hair. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, male wire hair. <laughs> yep. Tons of drive. They're, they're pretty tough. He was, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to answer that question. It's only going to take two words. For, worst mistake I ever made first wife. And <laughs> mistake with a dog try force breaking a dog with Doritos. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, Justin. You're going to leave me wondering about I, that. I, I, I want to tell you. I want to sleep I'll, on I'll tell you about it tonight yeah. at the RGS banquet. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, I thought. No, you got to tell me later. <laughs> we got we to we get through these questions. I got to get drunk to do it anyway. <laughs> That's how stupid it is. Uh, and you, do you have any training tips on dog steadiness in a blind? Okay, mine will sit fine, but for a few minutes he gets fidgety and wants to get up. So steadying for blind work. You know, so, duck or dove, I guess. You know. Yep. So. Everything goes back to where what obedience commands do you need? So there it's perfect sit, right? Yeah. Sit and stay. And then when you go to the blind, and this is where I think it was really helpful making that transition, that you need to be a dog trainer first and a hunter second. Bring a friend to do the shooting. Okay? You're mm-hmm. going to sacrifice a little bit of gunning for the right. sake of the long-term performance of the dog right. and you put a leash but on some him. training's got to happen it in does. the real world of course it does yeah, yeah to, that's how you're going to apply all this off-season right. stuff to the real world right and uh put a leash on that dog and you're going to every time he gets fidgety and wants to get upset no you got to sit right um so it has to take place otherwise the dog learns hey in the blind i can be fidgety i don't i can be fidgety i can right. do it you have to teach him that's not okay some dogs i bet he's probably a young dog right some dogs will are gonna as they mature you know, naturally get less fidgety. Some will stay fidgety for life. Yeah. 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 I, That's I, just obedience. Yeah. Yeah. And being enforced in that, yeah. in the blind. Yeah. And, you know, on, on that thread, like if you were to keep going for that early season and you fought this fidgetiness every time in the blind and you were trying to shoot ducks, we were just talking about that out on our walks. Dogs learn by repeated. Good or repeated bad. Mm-hmm. So that dog is going to be harder to fix if he keeps hunting that dog and expecting this thing to get less fidgety. Yeah. He, the dog's like, fidgety's good. Fidgety's good. And I got a duck. And it's not being corrected. It's not being corrected. So, yeah, yeah put the shotgun down and let your buddy shoot the ducks. Yeah. Um, what do you guys look for in puppies when choosing one from a litter? You want to go first? What do you, you said you guys, so what he, do you... Yeah. Um, I want the puppy who picks up the biggest stick that he can't carry and runs around with it. After okay. That, that's it. Yeah. Not much else I can. Uh, not much else I can pick for him. Sure. Okay. For me, um, I'm paying more attention to the litter than I am anything about the puppies in in that litter. In term, mom and dad. Mom and dad. That's what I'm paying attention to. Uh, beyond that, I don't feel I can tell anything at eight weeks old. Yeah. And the last. Three. I'm on a roll. The last three dogs that have made the team. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I didn't pick them. They were handed to me by the breeder and go. This one's yours. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So I'm going to stay with that method. I think, and, it and that's indicative of the people that I'm getting my dogs right. from. Our friends. It really is and, more and, important and, to get yeah. to know the research on the dog. It is. You know. And, and other than that, you're picking for either color, markings, or size. Right. All cosmetic stuff, right? right. Yeah, and uh, so because you're not going to be able to tell talent at eight weeks. I don't know. I don't see. I, mean, I, I can't. It, I don't think anybody no, can. No, you can get you can get fooled by luck. And well, fooled by randomness. And I think most of what you know influences what they become is what happens from then on. Right. Yeah. Right. Question for Ron Justin: First time dog bird dog owner, one year old English Setter. Great first season or great first year behind us now. Conditioned to gunfire, comes and goes on command. E collar conditioned. Killed my first few quail over point with her during the latter part of the season. Somehow I've yet to screw up this dog. <laughs> Would like to introduce steadiness and woe command this off season. With that being said, 
you can skin a cat 20 different ways, training tables, barrels, place boards, etc. I've been leading towards place boards, teaching the place command first and introducing woe, and eventually replacing the place with woe. If you got lost in my explanation, it's a method that Michael Donald uses, blah, blah, blah. I believe Hitchcock is teaching something similar. What's your thoughts on this method, place board to woe, I guess is what we're asking here. Yeah. That's and, and what's the best way to introduce this to a young dog, you know? Table, place board, barrel, woe post, other ways to teach it. None of them are bad. None of them are the end-all, be-all. Right. There's they're, no secret. They're, no. No, no secret one. And, and all of them, too, are just the really the initial steps in a finished woe command. Right. You know? I, I've said it before in your podcast, uh, woe on a barrel, perfectly done, they stand on a barrel and don't mm-hmm. move. And that's as far as you can take that. There are a few other right. things that are beneficial with that. Same thing with a place board. But it's a way that the dog has that. You got that much. Got place, yes. And yes. it's a starting point. Right. And there, But there is no better or magic. It's not about the method, you know. A, a really good dog trainer can use any method they want. Right. Because they know how to apply it and right. how to integrate it into the whole picture. Right. So if that's a method that he feels comfortable with and knowledgeable about, run with it. Right. It's yep. Yeah, that's your foundation. Right. You can start there. Just carry it on all the way until you're done. Whatever. And yeah. I think every trainer kind of gravitates to what fits them. Right. They really do. Right. Yeah. No, there's no secret there. Sorry, there. No secrets. Just stick with it. Yeah, you know, I, I know what he's talking about with the yeah. place board and, yeah. and Hickok stuff. Yeah, and, it works. Uh, like I said, yeah. but you've got to take that to the yard. You got to take it to the other the neighbor's yard. You got to take it to the woods. You, you yeah. got to just keep. You got to integrate it into real hunting situations. Real hunting you know, situations. when a dog will be stationary and watch a homing pigeon fly off, and you shoot a blank gun. Great start. It's a start. The dog is understanding the concept. Mm -hmm. If you think that dog is going to do the same behavior when a dozen sharp tails get up in front of him (laughs) and two guys are spitting death, right? It's raining dead birds. No. No. But you you have to start somewhere. Right, right. And and that can be a good start. Right. But you got to carry it on. Yeah. And maybe just to help him a little bit in wool. You, you get in that yard wool, whatever tool you're using, table, barrel, ground, wool, mm-hmm. uh, wool post, you're going to integrate <clears throat> birds into that At eventually. At some point, sure. Right. But still, on your method, either your wool post, your barrel, your, you're going to, there's going to be some early bird wooing on, in that one training area. If you're smart. If you're, <laughs> well, I just make sure <laughs> yeah. you understand. Yeah. Like, you know, that so, becomes, whatever pick, place you do, that's your schoolhouse that's where you do your lessons. Here's the principle. So this is what, the method that is not what to pay attention to. It's the fundamental principles of dog training, mm-hmm. right? Why why do things work? So many people want to know how when right. they should be yearning for why why. why. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's why that works. Everything going forward in a dog's training needs to contain something familiar to the dog from the previous step. Makes sense. Yeah. It should, so because it makes sense to the dogs. Right. And so by using what you've taught, whatever forum you've taught Woe in, right. and then adding the birds, it's not multiple brand new right. things to the dog. Yeah, you're not trying yeah, to make he goes, walk okay, chew gum this is already day. This is already a familiar routine to the dog. He right. already knows what's expected of me is to remain stationary until I'm released. Right. But, you know, now you're adding some, some sort of a bird into the picture. Right, yep. right. Yep. 